Well, hello, this is Eric. I'm here with Steve and Leloy, and today we're going to talk about the Return to Dark Tower. But first, I'm going to give you a not-so-brief overview of what's going on. We'll be right back. Okay, so this is Return to Dark Tower. I wanted to start here to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like on the table, as well as a little bit of what you do to get the game going. So first of all, we're going to turn on the tower. So I'm going to go under here and turn it on. And I love the, uh, the effects. They sound exactly like the old one when you turn it on. All right, and then once you get the tower on, I don't know if you can see the lights yet, a little bit. Uh, we're going to start up the app. And we're going to start a new game. And we're going to connect to the tower. There you go. All right, once it's made its connection to the tower, it's going to go right into, or it's going to calibrate. And then once it's calibrated, we're going to jump in here. Now I'm just going to make a couple of quick choices, just kind of show you a little bit about the menus and just to get into what's going on. Uh, so we're going to choose cooperative. We'll set up, say, for two players. All right now on this screen, this is all of the different bosses who have who each have their own individualized quest as well as for the main quest. So just for argument's sake, I'm going to choose the one it recommends that you start with. And that's Recover as Coach Treasures. And you can hear the tower making noises for the different bosses and creatures as we go. And then we're going to select Astrider is the boss for that one. I mean, technically you choose the boss for the adventure, though Astrider is really the one for that one. Uh, and then it gives you a choice of basically your different levels. So. As you can see here, you have a level two, a level three, and a level four, and you can make all these, these decisions yourself. So we can choose the Spine Fiend if we want to, and then go to level three, and let's just say the Frost Troll, and then we'll go to level four, and we'll say the Dragon, just because everybody loves dragons. All right, and then once you choose all your adversaries, we're going to continue. This is the summary of what we've chosen. All right, we're going to get right into the game. So it's going to tell you to set up a few things right off the bat. Uh, so as you can see right now, it says place two skulls on each village and bazaar. So we'll go ahead and do that real quick. You can see the little skulls are fantastic. So we're going to set two on each village and bazaar. So that's a village. And bazaar. That's a village. And bazaar, all the way around the table. Now, depending upon the number of players that you have, somebody may be a champion of each one of these different realms. There's south, west, north, and east. Or some of them may be uh, basically neutral. Uh, like if you were playing a one-player game, then you might be the champion of the west, but the rest of it was basically neutral. And whereas in a three-player game, you might have three champions sitting at different places in one neutral kingdom. And then once we have the skull set up in those different buildings, then we're going to go ahead and click continue again. Take the four River of Tire Fire tokens from the box. We got those right here, ready to go whenever we need them. And the first player gains Zeta as a companion. That's one of the allies that you can get during the game. You can see there's a whole kind of little deck of them. For us, it would be Zyda. So let's say the Brutal Warlord here was the first player. They would get Zyda right off the bat as their companion. And then it's going to tell us where to spawn some foes. So we're going to put a Spine Fiend on the Empty Glade, a Spine Fiend on Dewani, Spine Fiend on Pearl of the North, and then a Frost Troll in the Mountains of the Watchers. And then once you get all that set up, obviously I didn't do that, but you would do that. 
set them all up on the map. And then once that's ready, hit continue and you're in the game. And it tells you a little flavor, what the actual goal is. And it's month one. And just like that, the game is set up and ready to go. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about what's going on on the player board. As you can see, the left side here, that's just a flavor art and a, some text. Uh, this here tells you what you can do on your turn. And this over here are your virtues and potentially your corruptions as you would get those during the game. So as you can see, uh, the first thing that you do is you get your banner. Uh, that's different for every character. They all have different advantages, much like a pandemic where everybody kind of specializes in something. So the Brutal Warlords thing is Warrior. She just continually collects Warriors. So at the start of every turn, you're going to do your banner. He's going to get five warriors. You can see that you start with seven warriors and one spirit. And that's true for all of the heroes. And as I said, you know, you get your banner and then you can basically take your turn. And your turn is comprised of moving, which can be split up as you want to, and incorporating one up to one of the potential heroic actions and up to one of the reinforced actions. The heroic actions can be taken pretty much wherever it applies. Like for instance, you can cleanse to remove all skulls from a building. You can battle a foe in your space or you can quest, which is uh, very particular to things like uh, caravans, caves. Uh, the game itself will give you uh, good guy and bad guy quests, as I like to call them. Good guy quests basically being go and get uh, complete this quest and get an item or get an ally. And it could be things like just bring 40 warriors to this location, something like that. And bad guy quests meaning things like if you don't prevent this thing from happening by, say, bringing 40 warriors to this thing, then maybe another river of fire is, is put down on the board. And then, of course, like I said, you also get one reinforce action, uh, and that can be either free or you pay to have something special done. So you can see at a citadel, you can just get a potion, or you can, you can pay five spirit to gain a virtue. As I was saying, these are the virtues over on this side. Each character starts the game with three active. You have your two for your character. And again, this plays into the specialties. As you can see, uh, the, the warriors, or I'm sorry, the warlords is uh, plus one melee advantage and plus one wild advantage in battle. So again, his specialty is really about warriors and battle and things like that. And because in the game that we just set up, that I showed you, I will, well, the Brutal Warlord was the Champion of the West. You also get the Champion of the West virtue to start the game with. So each character is going to have three of these. You can see if we were the Champion of the North, it would have been this one, which is going to give a different advantage. The uh, Champion of the West is going to be two odd advantages in battle. Then you also have three virtues that are locked. Anytime that you want, you can go to a Citadel and for five spirit, you can flip one of them over and then that's active for the rest of the game. These virtues here also fit into that character's specialty. So it kind of makes you, it gives you big, pretty, pretty big advantages in different things, fighting, buying stuff, whatever it is that your character does. Um, and then once you unlock them, like I said, they're active for the rest of the game. So as a, for instance, if I would have unlocked this one after you reinforce, gain six warriors. So literally every turn, you could theoretically just get 11 warriors. You get five from your banner and then six after you reinforce. And unless the situation really just kind of takes you away from that, you pretty much always want to reinforce. You can get something for free, even if you can't pay for something. All right, so uh, I know I broke off here to talk about the virtues a little bit. Uh, you can see at the sanctuary, you can pay to remove all your corruptions. Again, this is where your corruptions would go. Uh, they're kind of like your life total in a way. I mean, you only have really three, as it were, because if anybody were to ever get their third, everybody loses. And you can also see that they have effects on them. So that one would be suspicious. You cannot carry more than two potions, whereas in, in, in a normal game, you can carry as many potions as you want. Uh, if you've got this corruption, you're limited to two. And then theoretically, I get another corruption. Now I'm cruel. After you reinforce at a village, lose a spirit. So basically, it costs the spirit to reinforce at a village. And then if I ever were to get my third one, that's it. Everybody loses. Okay. So as you can see, if you go to the sanctuary, you can pay a spirit to remove all your corruptions. If you go to a village, you can gain six warriors or pay a spirit to gain 12. If you go to a bazaar, you can gain a gear or you can pay two spirit to gain a treasure. So real quick, I'll give you a kind of a close-up of that. I'll just show you a couple of the gear. So for instance, we have dusty cloaks here. They give you a stealth advantage. 
And we have long swords here. They give you a melee advantage. You can see there's three of each of these. And that's true for all six different types of equipment. Uh, you can have as much as you can carry, but only one of each name. And in a four player game, that obviously means that not everybody's gonna get every piece because there's only three out there. And then of course, as I said, you can pay two spirit and gain a treasure. This is your deck of treasure cards. And they're gonna have various effects on them as well as advantages. And I'll get into advantages in the next segment because that really is kind of the heart of what's going on in a lot of this game. But as you can see, they all have different names, they all have different art, and they do different things for you. If you own this treasure, do not spend spirit for glyphs facing you. If you own this treasure, you can battle a foe in an adjacent space. That's nice. That, that means you can use the advantages of the space you're on. So for instance, the champion of the West gets two lot advantages in forest. I could theoretically stand in forest and fight something in a mountain next to me and still get my forest advantage. Uh, this is really the only thing that you have that has a limit. You can see the spot for treasures here. There's a spot for four of them. If you ever draw your fifth one, you got to discard one. Could be the one you just drew or that one. However you want to do it. And that's kind of an overview of what's going on on the boards. Okay, so if you remember back to the beginning when we set up the game in the app, uh, these are the enemies that we chose kind of arbitrarily. Uh, but the point is, you know, here's our Spine Fiend, you can see they're level 2, here's our Frost Trolls are level 3, Dragon level 4, and Asteroider is our hero, um, I'm sorry, uh, our villain, obviously, it's uh, currently in the tower at level 5. These are their little tokens for the board. You can see uh, it depends a lot on which one as to how many there are. Just as a for instance, uh, there are four different level 4s, there are two Dragon tokens, there is one Titan token. So. That obviously means the one Titan is incredibly powerful, whereas each dragon would be about half as powerful. And if there were, say, four of one of the other ones, then they'd probably be about as quarter as powerful as the uh, as the Titan was. Uh, it kind of works out kind of mathematically that way. Uh, but the point I'm trying to get here is, from here you can see their advantages. So if you look at the spine theme, he's got magic and beast. Okay, so these are keywords across basically everything. Uh, the Frost Troll is melee and humanoid. The dragon is melee and beast, and asteroid himself is magic and beast. So what happens is you go into these battles or or really like the quests themselves also, such as the caves and things like that, they're gonna have these keywords on them also. And what you're going to do is you're gonna count up how many advantages that you have. So if we were to go into battle against us find fiend, we're looking at magic and beast. Okay, so if you remember earlier, um, when I showed you the warlord, his advantages were uh, standing in forest because I was a champion of the West, uh, plus one melee and plus one in battle. Wowed advantage in battle. All right, so this isn't melee, that doesn't count, but since I'm initiating this battle in theory, then I'm gonna get the wild one. Wild basically means that it can apply to anything. So if I have three wild advantages, they just count. Okay, so. Right now, I basically have, let's assume we're not standing in a, in a forest, I basically have one advantage. I have one wild one because I'm in battle, right? But if I was wearing, if I was carrying along this treasure, that has a beast advantage. So he's beast, that counts. Now I have two advantages. If I happen to have, oh, you can barely see that, sorry. So as you can see, this carries the beast advantage. So the beast counts there. Now I have my wild and my beast. If I was also carrying along the brass talismans, they have a magic advantage. That's magic, that's magic. Now I have my wild, my beast, and my magic. So I'm walking into this battle with three advantages. And what that's gonna do is basically allow you to mitigate the damage or the effect that goes on during the battle or the encounter or whatever you wanna call that. Uh, if you also can flip these over and see what it's gonna do to you on the board, basically. Um, you don't really have to beat the the enemies on the board. Really, the only thing that you really have to do to win is to accomplish the main quest and then beat the boss when he comes out of the tower. But they're gonna do bad things to you on the board. So as you can see, the Spine Fiend says, well, when battling, magic foes manipulate the tower and beast foes make you lose extra warriors. So walking into that battle, we already know we're probably gonna need a lot of warriors because he's gonna make us lose more. 
and it's going to manipulate the tower. So manipulating the tower, I'll get into that in the next section real quick. Uh, it's going to be different things like rotating it around and potentially spitting out more skulls. But you can also see on the event, Spine Fiends make you lose warriors. So at the end of every round, there's an event. Could very well be that, like, say, every character within one spot of a fine theme, uh, Spine Fiend loses 10 warriors, something like that. Uh, so like I said, you don't really have to beat them to beat the mission, but they're just going to wreak havoc on the board while they're out there. So you kind of want to keep that under control as far as it goes. Okay, so now I'm going to show you uh, pretty much what a battle looks like. So uh, again, going by the example of everything that we've already set up to this point, uh, we're going to click this button, which means start a battle. And the, the app knows what's on the board. Remember, it told us to put three spine fiends out and one frost troll. So it knows there's no dragon and asteroid are still in the in the dark tower. So it will update this as you go, uh, based upon what the app knows is out there and what you've killed and things like that. So let's just say this is the first turn of the game. I'm gonna go uh, play the spine fiend. So I'm gonna put the spine fiend or click battle. All right, so remember the spine fiend was a level two. What that means is we have to choose two of these cards, then that's gonna happen to us. Level three would be choose three cards, level four would be choose four cards, and level five boss would be choose five other cards. And you have to get through the sequence of them to basically survive the battle. Um, so it's not really a battle so much as like I'm rolling dice against the computer or anything like that. It's more just like these are outcomes. All right, you'll see what I mean. So arbitrarily, let's say we'll choose that card and that card. And the first card we're going to face is this. It says lose seven warriors. Okay, so that's it. We can lose seven warriors and move on to the next card. But remember, we gathered three advantages before we entered this battle, right? We had the wild one because we're in battle. We had the one against beast and we had the one against magic. So we have a total of three. Take a side note, you can only ever use 10 in any particular encounter or battle. All right, but we have three walking into this. So we know we only have two cards. So let's say I don't really want to lose seven warriors. I'm going to lose an advantage. We're going to touch the arrow. Now I lose four warriors. Is that acceptable? Maybe not. Maybe I want to use one more of my three. Now we gain a spirit. So you went from bad things happening to good things happening. Doesn't always flip entirely, but you can usually at least mitigate it down to nothing. Okay, so but now we've used two of our three. We've beaten this card, we're gonna continue. The next card says, lose five warriors. We have one advantage left, may as well use it. So we're gonna lose three warriors. So assuming we have three warriors to lose, this whole battle cost us three warriors and we gained a spirit. And then we continue, or confirm rather. That's it, we won the battle. So that's an Obviously, a very short example of a battle. Uh, like I said, if you're fighting the dragon, you're going to have to fight off four cards. Plus, as the game goes on, you'll see the app will tell you they, they get stronger. So they'll increase their level as it goes. So what in the very early part of the game started with seven warriors by the near end of the game might have started with 30 warriors or so. And last, but certainly not least, we have the actual tower itself. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of what's going on here. Uh, the app will tell you periodically during the game that you're going to, it'll light up one of these doors and then you lose the door. So for instance, I might light this one up and then that door comes out. And that's bad for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, when it spits out skulls, as you can see at the beginning of the game, there's only four spots for the skulls to come out uh, at the very bottom of each level. And it basically like, kind of like a dice tower in there, like they're doing a ping pong around in there till they come to rest somewhere. So in theory, when it told me to take this off, it could have dumped a couple of skulls out there, which didn't need to be immediately placed. Uh, alternatively, there's also glyphs in here. I'll try to find one for you. All right, so that's a glyph. It's not lit up right now. I'd have to go through a whole sequence of things to make it actually do that. But the point is when a, a glyph is showing on your side of the tower, then it costs you a spirit to do that action. So that looks like a battle. That looks like the battle glyph. So if that side was facing you, where your home kingdom is, no matter where you're at on the board, it would cost you a spirit to go into battle. Okay. So, uh, and again, there's going to be other things that go on. These are going to rotate. They're going to kind of spin in there. So it kind of changes who gets the openings and who has the, the glyphs and whatnot. But that's basically what the, what the tower does. And then, I don't know if you saw at the uh, bottom of the card, but at the end of every turn, you drop a skull right down into the tower. It's got some kind of photosensitive or whatever, uh, but as soon as you do that, and in fact, I'll just use my finger real quick to show you, it's going to end the turn. And then it moves on to the next player's turn. So, and that's the tower.
So all those different pieces pretty much go into making up what is the Return to Dark Tower. Um, as I was saying, you know, you move around the map, uh, defeating maybe the monsters that are out there, uh, trying to clear the skulls from the buildings. If any particular building were ever to get its fourth skull, uh, two things happen. So first of all, that building and all those skulls are destroyed. And by the building being destroyed, the champion of that kingdom is going to gain a corruption. So in this case, it was the champion of the north would have given corruption. If this, if there was not a champion of the north in this game, the building is still destroyed, but nobody gets the corruption. Uh, at the same time, those four skulls are now out of the game. And that's vitally important also, because remember, at the end of every turn, you have to drop a skull into the tower to mark it as the end of your turn to move the app onto the next player's turn. If you ever get to the point where you can't drop any skulls in there because you're out, Everybody loses the game. Somebody gets their third corruption, everybody loses the game. If you don't beat the monster the monster in the tower by the end of the sixth uh, month, everybody loses the game. So basically, you keep wandering around and trying to kind of play a little bit of the whack-a-mole here and there as trying to clear the skulls as they come up, trying to deal with the monsters, and slowly but surely trying to gather up enough strength to complete the main mission, which then releases the boss, and then you beat the main boss and you can win the game that way. And that is pretty much everything there is to Return to Dark Tower. Okay, thank you for uh, going through that whole thing with me. I appreciate your patience. Uh, so let's break right into what we think about it. Um, Lloyd, why don't you start us off? Um, so I don't have a nostalgia factor with Return of the Dark Tower. I never played it as a kid. Um, so my going into it was completely blind. Uh, there was a big tower on the table that Apparently, you could light up and spit stuff out of it, and there's a giant map. Um, but before we got there, um, there was all this uh, setup involved um, to kind of customize the mission. And um, the people who played before me played the first mission, so they all wanted to move on to the second mission. And I don't know if there's some kind of overarching story through the whole game or whatnot, but I didn't seem to miss anything. He read me the story, and I was like, okay, cool. It's an adventure. We're going to go fight the bad guy in the tower that um i forgot exactly what he did um my essential goal was to get a bunch of uh warriors but before we even started the um the setup was like okay here's here's a, a few different bad guys you can choose from to you know come out and fight on the map and you kind of choose one of those and then you choose i think it did that thing three times and we ended up with like frost giants um Brigands and um, a Titan. I don't know where the Titan came from. It might have been from the third setup. You kind of went around the table and asked people, you know, kind of what they wanted and let us look at the, the phone and, you know, kind of pick. And we just kind of chose, you know, kind of stuff we had overlap on with our with our innate advantages, you know. Um, so from what I can tell, there is a ton of variability in the setup between the different player characters, the different bad guys you can put out and the different missions you can choose. Um, and then once you get into the game, there's also, you know, even more variability because random events happen and maybe the events all fit into the story, but they seemed kind of random because there was like a dungeon that really had nothing to do with the main bad guy, but it just kind of popped up. So I don't know if it was random, but there was all this randomness going on, which I really like because it, it you know, it's not just, you know, you play, this is a pandemic style game. Bad stuff is popping up on the board. You got to go beat it down. Um, and then go contend with the overall major, you know, threat. Um, and, you know, this one, rather than just have, oh, there's more cubes popping up in, you know, Hong Kong again. Uh, this one was like, oh, there's a dungeon. Um, there's there's some bad guy that popped up over here. And if you don't go deal with this mini bad guy, then whoever's got this like black mark on him is going to suffer some horrible consequences. So, you know, I kind of, you know, mix stuff up and it, I really like that. Um, if you go back to all of our old, old, old reviews, <laughs> my number one pick for usually things I like is player variability. And this game just has it across the board, even across the actual gameplay itself um, with the minions and the bad guys and all that stuff. So, And, and that is a big improvement uh, with the sort of restoration of this game. Mm -hmm. You know, the original Dark Tower was... 
it was basically the same every time you played. Yeah, I mean, every time you played. it was random where the key was in each kingdom and uh, the number of uh, brigands that you would fight the tower and some random encounters as you went around. But it was it was basically the same game. There were no special player powers, or anything like that. Um, and uh, it was a competitive game. And, uh, you know, where this one is by default co-op, although it has the competitive in there. But uh, I, I do really feel like this is a good restoration, right? I grew up playing the original Dark Tower. My brother, you know, got it when it was new. We played the heck out of that game. I, I you know, and I played it as an adult. Uh, and I, I have not played it with my kids yet, you know, so I can't really speak to that. I do really want to do that. And I have not played the competitive version uh, in, in this new restoration either. I really want to play that as well. But like even putting all of that aside, having just played with adults, uh, this restoration of it, like I, I'm feeling it, right? I, I feel the dark tower here and I'm excited about having this stupid, ridiculous, unnecessary tower in the middle of the table that spits skulls at me, you know? I mean, all of that could have probably been part of the app or whatever, I mean, but I, I don't care. It's cool and I'm 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 here for it, right? Yeah, actually, um, I'm going to kind of hijack this because you kind of ended up where I'm going to end up in a minute. So I'm just going to go ahead and get there. So um, I'm going to talk about kind of everything together. So I know, you know, we do the like and the dislike in that. All right. So I'm going to give you the short version right now. My dislike is I think it's too long. And my like is I enjoy the show. All right. So now what I mean is anybody that watches us at all or knows me, I love a long game. I love a long game. I like to just play something for the afternoon and sink into it and really get into the game. But I don't feel like I'm that involved in this game. I feel like most of it happens in the app and on other people's turns. And a lot of my turns are like, I'm going to go over here and clear these stalls. I'm going to get a treasure. My turn's done. And then these other people go off and do things. And the app takes 10 minutes to do things. And I'm, and I'm watching the show. So as a game, it's not my favorite game. I think it's a little dry. There's not a whole lot going on. But as a show, I think it's fantastic. I think it's a great experience to have with your game and friends. I think it's more than a game, which is good because I kind of, the game's okay. You just play a little whack-a-mole and walk around and the app does almost everything. But I love the show. I think it's great. And I think they did an excellent job restoring this to that spirit because I feel exactly the same about the original game when I played it. I was like, well, the game's okay. You just kind of wander around and do a couple of things, but you get to play with a tower and it makes sounds and cool things happen. And I, I feel exactly the same way about this. It's obviously a different experience. The tower used to run everything where now the app does, but I just think they did an amazing job of spiritually redoing this game, like Phoenix, you know, coming back from the flames. And this is the newest modern version and i think it's almost perfect really for what it is trying to do which is to mm -hmm. restore that original game what do you think steve well you know i i want to riff a little bit on what you said um so it was interesting the first time i went to play this uh even though i have my own copy the first time i got to play it was at the game store you know i went into the game store for a game night and somebody i already had it set up so bonus i didn't have to set it up right and uh <laughs> and uh you know i i like having i just didn't care which character i got i was like i'll give you the purple one so i got the soul reaper or whatever it's called and you're right it was kind of boring my job was to go around the essentially to play my character optimally which, you know, in a co-op game, you kind of feel like you should probably be playing optimally yeah. for everybody else's sake. You know, I should just be dealing with the corruption and I was collecting spirit because we needed spirit to to mm -hmm. defeat some quests or whatever. You need to collect like 20 spirit to defeat this quest, right? So, uh, so you know, I was doing that. It was kind of boring. At one point, I just went and fought some brigands because it's like, I'm not going to get to fight anything. Like, that sounds right. like the fun part I'm of this just, game, right? Let, so let me have some fun it, for a it was right. It was not the smart thing for me to do on my turn, but I was just like, <laughs> screw it. I'm going to go pick a fight. <laughs> you know, like, so, so I did it. And, um, and that, and that sort of dovetails into my negative here because, you know, you talked about all the things happening in the app and because I was at a game store, because the guy who brought the game had set it up and it was on, uh, you know, his phone, he doesn't want to pass his phone around the table. Right. And it's, you know, you've got to have like a Bluetooth 2.0 low power or something. So you can't just use any old device. You've got to have, you know, a good device to run this with. So if you don't have a tablet or something you want to put, pass around, you've just got the phone. And so the guy's just asking me like, 
okay, cards two through six or whatever, which ones do you want? I'm like, three and five. He's like, okay, lose three warriors. I'm like, okay, I'll use an advantage. Like, I didn't see what was going on. I didn't get to interact and, and play with that. And there's so much of the, you know, immersion was, I guess, in that app. And, uh, you know, in the dungeons too, like when you see, you see the map of the dungeon or whatever. Yeah, I agree. What, what is that over there on your phone? You know, like, I you can't know. imagine playing it without at least like, now, like when we played it, Kind of one or two people ran the app, but everybody could see it on the tablet. You know what I'm saying? So it was it was still a focal point of everything going. I can't even imagine playing this game and not seeing the screen. For yeah, playing. I mean, if there was a big tablet, or if we were at somebody's house and they had a TV nearby, you could cast to or something, right? Like that. That you know, and it's great when you play like that. Like, but yeah. if you don't and, and you don't have that, it's it is a little bit of a letdown. I mean, I still enjoy the experience. Part of that, of course, was it was my first play. Um, I wouldn't want to play like that again, though. And that is that hampers it a little bit, you know, like that limits the amount of times I'm going to get to play this game because you've got to do this whole setup and I've got to figure out, you know, grab a tablet or have a TV or something. And so, yeah, you know, that's so that's my dislike. So, you know, overall, I, I still I, I like the game. I'm going to play the game. I'm going to keep the game. But, you know, I wish. Ah. I just wish that part wasn't missing sometimes. Yeah, I I can't even imagine. Yeah, they should have they they should have done like uh, like how like the uh, the the app based games on like Blu-ray players or Roku's or even PlayStation and Xbox does, where everyone logs in with their phone and everyone sees what's going on. You have a central screen, but all the phones are communicating, and whenever I choose something. You know, it shows up on other people's phones, and I mean, they're doing like Jackbox party and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like Jackbox or whatever. Yeah, everybody yeah. just logs in and sees the whole thing. You know, or yeah, even so if I could play it on a laptop, right? A laptop is a lot more convenient than any of that other stuff that I just said. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think that it's a whole lot easier to plug that into a TV than it is to simply be able to Chromecast or something to it, because you know, like in our game room, that's where my 10 year old plasma's at. I'm not broadcasting to that. I'm <laughs> plugging something into it. And I don't think there's anything right now, anyway, where I could get that on some kind of device and plug it into that TV. So, tablet's the best that I can do. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm hoping they put that out there later or at least open it up because if I'm not wrong, uh, like we were talking about actually just a few minutes ago before we started up, I think you can only get this on like Google Play and Apple Store and or the vice versa or whatever, but that's it. So that's kind of where you get it. You play it on a tablet or you pass around a phone around it, I guess. Yeah, that's what we did. The guy passed his phone around when it was our turn. Like, hey, you're going to go into a fight here. Here's the phone. Um, but that kind of just goes into my dislike for the game is that I just the, the gameplay of what was happening on the phone was so boring and dry compared to the theme. Like, hey, I'm going to go fight this guy. And what am I doing? Oh, he's, I choose some random cards. I flip them over. And then it's like, oh, I have six advantages in this fight. I guess I'm going to use three on this first card. And then I have to get a second card. So I'm going to use the other three here. Or, you know, what, that's, that's what it boils down to. Like, there's, there's no real sense of I'm going to lose this fight. Even when we fought the, the, the boss, um, the the player who went and fought the boss, like I went over and like positioned myself. I went and got a special bow so I could I could stay in the hills and get my advantage. And I set on it all up. And uh, the guy just basically went in on the turn right after mine or right as I was getting the bow, went in, took a couple shots at him and then was able to just back out of the fight and leave all the damage and then just go back into the fight on his next turn with all of his advantages back in place. And I was like, that was a lackluster boss fight. Like he could just like go in and hit him a couple times and not have to worry about losing. Um, and uh, we, we talked yeah. about this game a, a I, while I don't back. mean to cut you off or anything, but this is kind of the, the dislike that I wasn't going to mention kind of, because I think it's a little easy really. Now I played yeah. three times. The first time we got stomped. That's the one when I talked about that in the, in the yeah. last, uh, plays of the month or whatever like yeah, he just yeah. got destroyed but you know what now i knew how to play so the two times i played since then we won kind of easily now oh, I, yeah i didn't really want to make it a dislike because there is a higher difficulty level and i haven't played that yet 
I'm sure that's why it's there. Because if they'd have started you on that, I'd pr- you'd probably play it two or three times and be like, we're never going to beat this, and that'd be the end of it. You know, so but, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I don't. I don't necessarily think the difficulty was the issue because the gameplay is still going to be the same at the end of the, the turn, which is I'm going to go into a fight and have some advantages, and I'm only going to go into the fight really if I have enough advantages. Um, or I'm going to let somebody else who has the better advantages go take that fight. And it was never like we were pressed on time. Um, there was three of us playing and, and it could have, it, it really could have been the, the situation we picked. I picked the, the warrior guy who gets Bannerman, like right on the start of his turn. Um, and then just so happens through one of the quests, I got a glove that allowed me to get more Bannerman whenever I did the get banner whatever the action is at the village that gets bannerman yeah, really. so i was racking up like 30 guys a turn i was able to go do the first part of the mission after a couple turns once i completed that quest but no one ever had any real issues with anything but it all came down to the same thing go onto the app pick a couple cards apply a couple advantages and then something happens there was no there was no like oh your advantages didn't work Oh, you know, something no, else. You're happened. absolutely right. It's incredibly oh, randomness. when you get into it's, it. Yeah, it was just in it this just, type of game, I expect to have some type of randomness or something happen that's going to affect the outcome. This was very, very like, I'm going to say it, it, this felt like a very dry Euro to me. And that's all of the choices were made for me. And I only went in there when I knew I could do it because it didn't make any sense not to. Whereas, um, other games, you know, give me a die roll. Like, let me possibly lose my advantage and suffer just something to randomize. It was just like, it was it was a checkbox. Like, check this off, check this off. Okay, I'm going in, check this off, check this off, done. Okay, that was fun. It told me a story, but at the end of the day, I didn't do anything. I didn't roll any dice. I didn't draw some cards. It was just flip a card and apply an advantage. And the advantages didn't even matter. Like, it wasn't like, oh, sorry, that guy's immune to swords now. You can't use your sword advantage. No, nah, I had an advantage. It was just I fought him in the hills and I had an advantage because he was a human. It was just very, very dry. Yeah, there there is time pressure in the game, um, but really it's only if – you know, you could, you could be in setups, right? You could just have a setup where you get the right characters and the right – Mm-hmm. monsters and you know you're just gonna sail through it right but you know I, I played one time and boy there was one super hard quest out there and uh, uh it would like we kept getting our number maximum number of advantages you could use in a in a fight kept getting reduced right it's like oh crap we need to go deal with that right otherwise we're not gonna be able to fight the boss right you know like um so i i definitely have felt some time pressure when playing the game um you know it's sort of interesting because i got this to play with my kids i I know i haven't done it yet Mm -hmm. but you know that is why i backed it and so like i'm okay with the combat being sort of simplistic because you know my kids are only eight years old right so and i want to play with them but But i'm an eight-year-old kid at heart i want to roll some dice when i'm fighting something like (laughs) Champions of Midgard, you're rolling dice, and that's a worker placement. You're still randomness in your outcome. There's no, here's the thing. There's no ah, moment whenever you get that lucky dice roll. We played G.I. Joe, like, right before this game, the deck builder, and it came down to the last turn, and it was G.I. Joe uses dice rolls to resolve combat, and we just barely squeaked it out. And as soon as I rolled the dice and we hit it, the other two people at the table were like, yeah! And that yeah, you're right. That, that, that doesn't just like, happen. Yeah, we it, finished it. We're done. Nothing in the game. So like, <laughs> you know, either you lose and you're like, oh, we lost, or yeah. I agree with you. You you like roll up in there with a bunch of advantages, and you know, you roll through the cards, and you're like, all right, we won. But you're like, all right, good job. And you shake hands, like, well done. All right. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna have to cut out that one little rant by Lloyd because you can apply that to about a third of the games we play here, right? <laughs> like, oh, there's no roll dice. Yeah, moment in this game. What the heck? <laughs> you know? it's cards it's like it's a Gricola, Lloyd. Come on. <laughs> you know. Uh, not a Gricola. <laughs> <laughs> I think they kind of hide a lot of that kind of behind like smoke and mirrors. You know what I'm saying? Like, what I mean is. The game holds an air of mystery because you don't know what's going on, because you don't know the probability of anything happening. You don't know what the cards are like. It just shows you the backs of what 10 cards and just like pick two. I don't even know what they are. You know what I'm saying? So it it doesn't even matter what you pick. It's just for fun, for 
I see that's Tiff's argument. Tiff says it doesn't matter which ones I pick; it's just going to save the thing. And I said, no, 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 no. Like You're picking specific, like Restoration games, games. Actually, outcomes. said it doesn't matter. <laughs> what really? So Tiff, yeah. Right? yeah, Tiff was right. You're wrong, man. <laughs> well, that is just, we gotta we gotta. Just I wanted to at like, least think that I could pick the cards, and it actually mattered what was on the card. We got a card that nothing happened. Like he had to pick three cards, and one of them was like, you know, do this advantage. The next card was. Nothing happens. It was just a blank card. So that's always going to be a blank card on that particular quest. No, no. It's if somebody. Oh, are you talking about a quest or fighting the boss? Uh, oh, because I don't. If it, you're it fighting wasn't a boss fight, it was in uh, one of the quests or one of the other fights. They they flipped a card, and the second card they flipped was just a nothing. Like oh, it was. I mean, like, yeah, hey, we got lucky card. Yeah, I haven't seen that either. I do know that, like, when you're fighting the boss or whatever, when you use advantages to it reduce sticks. a card, it's it sticks. Rounds, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe that's what was going on. But yeah, no, I haven't seen that. I mean, hey, I, I know that co-ops can get brutal. So I yes. I mean, it, talk about sort of, yeah, moments. I love that in co-ops where you've got some brutal co-op and you're like, mm-hmm. oh boy, my turn's over. All right, everybody. What are we going to get? <laughs> you know, what are we going to get smacked by now? Are we going to survive this? And you turn over the nothing happens card. And you're like, yeah, nothing happened. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. That's a, yeah, I never got that in Dark Tower. As much as it, I was expecting that, I never got that feeling at all. It was just, oh, we finished it, and he was like, okay, yeah, we're done. Let's start cleaning up. Oh, okay. That was yeah. anticlimactic. Do you want help? No, no, no. I'll clean it all up. I know where everything goes. Okay, see, I'm heading downstairs then, I guess. <laughs> I'll go play something else while you clean this up for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it actually doesn't take that long if you've done it a few times. Just saying. <laughs> 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 but you know i don't know I, I feel like i like it a lot i feel like it's definitely not in my top 10 uh but it's definitely in my top 100 and at this point i don't know where it settles in there but like i said i'm not really putting it in there for the gameplay because i agree it's kind of dry and most of it happens on the app anyway but but like i said at the beginning i think it's just great i played it at four i played it at two I think it's great. I think you have a great time with the people that you're playing with. And it's, it's it's more of a shared experience. And like I said, I just feel like that was the way the first one was anyway. So I think it's incredibly faithful to the original. Uh, I would play again. Uh, Steve, would you play again? Yeah. And I mean, I am going to play with my kids. And if my kids like it and enjoy it and want to play it more, I'm going to like it and enjoy it more. So that's where I am right now. It's like, I like it. But I mean, I could end up loving this just because my kids love it. What do you think, Lloyd? Would you play again? Oh, yeah, I'll play it again. Um, I, I do like the, like I said, I, I like I like the idea of what's happening. I just wish there was more actual gameplay in there. There's just, to me, there's just not a whole lot of gameplay. It's just, like I said, flip cards and apply advantages and then something happens. But there's, I wish just like when you go to apply the advantage, like something was, there was some kind of check or something, something that, Oh, I want to apply two advantages, and the more I, the more I apply, the riskier it gets. Just something to make it a more of a little bit of a push That's your luck or something. Thought. Right. The more of them I actually use, the higher the chance that something can go just like critic critically wrong. Right. Like, yeah. Like you've critically failed it. You put so much into it. That would be fun. So, interesting. Just just as like an aside, real quick. Um, we talked about this kind of before. No, no, but we, we never do asides in our videos. <laughs> <laughs> this game. Which is, you know, similar in theme to that. You know, it's you're, you're playing in, you know, fantasy world, whatever. And it's pandemic style, so you're doing kind of the same thing. But in that game, when we got down to the boss, I it's it resolved on dice rolls. You play cards to get more dice to try to boost your stuff. But when it came down to it, the table, like, turned against me because I was like, I'm going for it, guys. They're like, no, no, no. If you go for it and fail... We're, we're going to lose. The safe bet is to just do this. So I did the safe bet and we won. But there was at least discussion of should I go for it or not? Could we survive another round? Like they had to kind of, you know, how you do in pandemic, you kind of mass out like, oh, if we don't do this, then we're going to lose in three turns. We kind of figured it out. Um, so I got voted down. It, it, it was it was Lloyd, a sad Don't let them vote you down, man. It's a World of Warcraft game. Just scream Leroy Jenkins and get in there. <laughs> <laughs> I just roll the dice and yell it. But I didn't because I wanted them to play it again and I wanted them to like it. Um, and they all did. They really liked it. But um, 
yeah, that that had that that you know push your luck element. And I just feel like the theme on this game and the type of game it is that it's you know kind of this Ameritrashy game. It's missing the Ameritrashy part of Ameritrash in there, which is the randomness and push your luck that most of these games have, and it just doesn't have it. And I guess it's fine. I just expected it to have it. I didn't expect to go in there with kind of this, you know, methodical choice to everything. But maybe, maybe going in now that I know what it is, my expectations are a little bit lower. And uh, I don't know. Maybe that had a lot to do with that you didn't play the first one because I really feel like it is a very good representation of the first one. Because just like the original, he didn't like combat wasn't combat. You just kind of oh, combat was awful in the original one. It was so dumb. It was dumb. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I feel like they did a really good job of of that. So I I almost feel like if you played the old one, you're going to appreciate it more because it really did like bring that spirit back. They did an excellent, excellent job of reincarnating that whole experience. And if you didn't have that experience, then yeah, you're probably looking for something else that's not actually in there. So I I hear what you're saying. How how did combat and stuff work in that one? In, in, in the original one, you had a yeah. number of warriors, and you would go up mm-hmm. against a number of brigands, and it ran, and it did this just like a die roll or whatever internally, right? Yeah, there would be a battle, like, and he, and and the brigands were like better than your warriors or whatever, right? So the big, if the brigands hit you, you would lose one warrior, but if you hit the brigands, they lost half their amount. So you would go into a battle at like. 50 brigands versus 50 warriors and you would watch your warriors get down to 49 48 47 46 40. but somewhere around 30 they would get knocked down to 25 and once you hit them one or two times it was over right so it was just you mm-hmm. sitting there watching this dumb countdown just you had, hoping to get the lucky there's hit. more choice in this one you know what i'm saying like I was just watching the countdown going come on come on get a hit in <laughs> Come on. But, no, but see, that right there, there's, that, that to me seems like the, the randomness of the push your luck. Like, yeah, how do you go in and do this? You might have liked it better, right? <laughs> I don't know. It's just this one, I didn't feel that. Like, I didn't. And maybe, I, like I said, maybe my expectations were wrong. But after it got all set up, I expected to have, you know, this Arkham Horror or pandemic style, like, randomness thing happening. And it just didn't. It was a lot of, it felt like I was playing, like, uh, uh, a swords and sorcery like themed Excel spreadsheet. That's what it felt like. <laughs> it was very mathy and just like eh. somebody put some clip art in there of uh, some bad guys, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. The minis were cool. Yeah, it looked great, but I didn't like go fight them or anything. I just went and stood next to them, and then I I tick some boxes and cards. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe if it wasn't an app and I was flipping cards, maybe that would have done it. Maybe it's the tactile thing. I yeah, don't know. you know, Tiffany wanted that too that would have been a mess of the game i think but that was her thing too she actually wanted to shuffle the deck and flip the cards like it actually mattered which cards she chose she chose you know like we just talked about i'm (laughs) apparently naive because i was like it does matter you choose the cards so you know so apparently her her view is exactly what you're talking about she wants that experience of knowing that these things are actually out there and not just some magic thing that a computer decides at some point you know what i'm saying so, oh yeah the computer always cheats that goes all the way back to nintendo right like ah the computer's cheating <laughs> yes it's so always going to pick the right number because it knows what a button i pressed it yes <laughs> yes it does so eh, i don't know i would play it again i would play it again with different expectations and see if i enjoy it more i like i said i just maybe expected something that i wasn't supposed to expect so I enjoy the show. I'd like to see the rest of the stuff, too, because I've only seen, at this point, a handful of the adventures. Now, you're going to see most of the monsters. There's like four level twos, four level threes, four level fours, and a handful of bosses. But there's a boss for every, you know, adventure. So mm-hmm. you're going to cycle through the twos, threes, and fours pretty quickly, I think. But I'd like to see all the different adventures because they're not going to be terribly, terribly different, but it's different. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play the competitive version because I have to for nostalgia reasons. And I'm going to play it with my kids. And if my kids don't ask to play it again, it is out of here because that is a big box. It's a big box, yeah. It's an investment in space and money. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. I, I like it for what I've played of it, but not enough to justify it being three games size box. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it, unless it's, you know, Unless my kids really like it and really want to play it, then yeah. Oh man, you're just baiting me. 
Steve. Steve. You're trying to get me off on a rant about the size of games and all that stuff again. I'm not <laughs> buying into it, man. At this point, we're just going to cut it off. This, Thank this... you for joining us for our <laughs> review of Return to Dark Tower. I'm Eric. One of these is Steve, and one of these is Little Boy. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, y'all. We hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please leave a comment or hit the like button. It really does help us out. If you have suggestions for future videos, let us know in the comments as well, and then subscribe to see what we come up with next.